Praise the Lord and welcome everyone to class. Uh, thank you, online students, for joining us. And also welcome to our uh, e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on. Welcome to our in-person students. Uh, we'll begin um, our study of uh, Romans chapter. Which chapter? Two. We finished one? <laughs> Romans chapter 1, okay, we have to study Romans chapter 1. We just uh, began uh, last week by looking at the introduction, and today we'll start studying uh, chapter 1. Are you all excited to study chapter 1 of Romans? Yes, okay, we'll begin. So can uh, Sri Radha, the mic is near you, so God has chosen you to pray. <laughs> okay. So let's uh, pray, yeah. Father God, we thank you for this time. Thank you for this day. And uh, we surrendered this class into your hand. You, um, when we came here to learn from your word, you uh, give us the uh, mind and the heart so that we can uh, take everything from you by your Holy Spirit, God. You guide us, you lead us, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. So let's um, turn to Romans chapter 1 in your Bibles, please, everyone. It's good to open your Bibles, to follow through as we study. You know where Romans is, right? Old Testament or New Testament? <laughs> okay. Romans chapter 1, okay. Um, verses 1 to verse, uh, there are 31 verses so 32 verses sorry so can um i don't know if uh, the online students can join us also in reading it will be nice there are five in-person students so you can either read five or six verses each and then we can do with it okay so online students would you like to begin anyone likes to read maybe if you're reading you can read some three or four verses if none of you online students are reading, then we can have uh, our in-person students reading at least six verses each, so we can cover it. Online students, anyone like to begin? Verses one to four. Shall I read, Pastor? Yes, Chaya, please. Thank you. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophet in, in the Holy Scripture regarding his son who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David. Leave it, leave it, leave it. You should have just left it. First I read more for that. Uh, sorry, Chaya, we couldn't hear you because uh, you know, we just tried to increase the volume here and we couldn't hear. You can please read again from verses 1 to 4, please, if you don't mind. Thank you. Yes, Master. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Regarding his son, who, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David, and who, through the spirit of holiness, was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Chaya. Anyone mm -hmm. else would like to read verses 5 to verse 8? Online students? Shiv Kumar, Prince, Ravali, Nina, John. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. Please continue, Nina. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. 
to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Amen. Even as we're reading these verses, I just want you to, you know, um, just hear from God. If there's anything the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, or you've read this chapter before, or you've heard this in a sermon before, it's impacted your life. You know, after reading all of these verses, I'll just give you some time to share if something that just leapt out of the scripture verses here from your pages to spoke to you, minister to you, or something that you read before and that thought has been reiterated, God is speaking to you, you can share that so all of us can be edified. Okay. So anyone else would like to read uh, another four verses? Online students, Ravali, Shiv Kumar, Prince, four verses, nine to 12, please. Prince, you would like to read Shiv Kumar Ravali? Okay, if not, uh, our um, in person students can just read five or six verses each. You can begin with three rather and then we can go. From nine, five verses, 13, nine to 13. For God, God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. Fourteen to eighteen. Yes. Fourteen to eighteen. I am a debtor both of both to Greeks and to Werner, Werner Weiss both to wise and to unwise. <clears throat> so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes <clears throat> for because what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creations of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and God had, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkness profession professing to be wise they become fools and change to glory of the incorruptible god into an image made like corruptible men and birds are four foot pitch, boast and creep beast and creeping things verse 24 therefore god also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of god for the lie and worshiped and served the create creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever amen for this reason God they God gave them up to wild passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men 
leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in them the penalty of the error which was due. From verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all right, unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, desight, evil mind, mindness. They are whispers, uh, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who know in this righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserve, deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who part, practice them. Amen. Thank you. So, anyone likes to share anything that, uh, you know, as you were reading, just uh, leapt out of scripture, leapt out of your pages, just spoke to you, something that you had read in the past, that God is reminding you, something that you learned in the past by reading the scripture passage. Uh, you like to share, anyone? Uh, so I felt that uh, the verse 5, hmm. like, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Okay. I felt literally like, okay, you also now, because maybe I'm from a different place, like you also called of Jesus. It's like literally touching my heart that time when you were reading. Okay. That you are also called by Jesus Christ. Okay. Anyone else? Anything that you read that really touched your heart, that ministered to you? Nothing? Okay, there's nothing. We'll um, look at uh, uh, and study Romans chapter 1. Okay, um, like all letters that we see in the New Testament, you know, in the introduction, it basically talks about what? In all letters we read in the New Testament, we see in the introduction, what do we see? Greetings, yes. In what is mentioned in the greetings? Huh? I am the apostle of Christ, okay? Okay, born servant. What is mentioned in the greetings? From whom this letter is written, or who writing, who is writing this letter? And then who is the audience? that this person who is writing this letter is addressing to, so whom the letter is written to. So basically it's talking whom is the letter from and whom is the letter written to, yes. And also it's talking, it gives an introduction to what is going to follow in this letter or the reason why this letter is being written, okay. Even when we, um, nowadays we don't write it, but you know, um, uh, uh, but usually when we, even when we write an email or a letter, we say to, right? To whom we are writing it, and then and we end the letter from who uh, who is writing the letter. And we always have a subject, and the subject we are mentioning, you know, what this letter is all about. Okay. So here also Paul is um, writing uh, this letter. He is saying that you know Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Okay, or Paul, a born servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. So, how is Paul introducing himself here? 
as a bond servant. Okay. Um, now Paul is writing this letter to the church at which church? A church at Rome, right? Do everyone in in Rome know Paul? Yes or no? No. Why? He's never visited that place. He's not somebody who started that place. Okay, started the church in that place, but he's just writing this letter. But he's writing his letter and he's saying, you know, I'm Paul, and he's addressing himself as a born servant of Jesus Christ. He's telling them who he is because people don't know who he is, okay, excepting for Aquila and Priscilla and maybe a few others, but he's mentioning that he is Paul. And he's saying that he's a bond servant. Now, bond servant is what? What, what do you understand by this word bond servant? Sold out for the master. Sold out for the master, okay. Another word for bond servant? A slave, right? Not just a servant, but a Slave. Born servant means somebody who's bonded to that person for the rest of their lives. Or another word you can use is slave. So Paul is basically using this, uh, borrowing this word from the Old Testament. Okay. Now, what do we understand about born servant from the Old Testament? A born servant is subject to his master to work for his master. He's totally submitted, surrendered. And he's totally under the subjection of his master. But in the Old Testament, we read that in the seventh year, okay, every seven years, the slave is allowed to go free. Or, you know, the slave is supposed to be set free. So if you have worked as a slave for seven years, or someone has worked as a slave for seven years, the end of seven years, they are free to Go. They are a free person. That is what God had initiated as the law for the Israelites in the Old Testament. Or in the year of Jubilee, that is 50 years, a bond servant is also free to go. But sometimes these bond servants, they love their masters so much because their masters have taken care of them so well, it's taken care of them, their families. So they want to live with their master for the rest of their lives. In those cases, at the end of seven years, or in the end of the year of Jubilee, that is 50 years, the bond servant has a choice. He can say, hey, I don't want to be set free. I don't want to go free. Okay. I want to stay with you for the rest of my life. In those cases, those bond servants, they will bow their ears, okay, and they will put, you know, a, a ring in their ears, and that will show that they are a bond slave or a bond servant for the rest of their life for their master. Okay, so it is something that they choose to do to submit to their master for their rest of their lives, or they are something that they're doing to say, hey, I'm willing to stay for the, with my master to be a servant or slave for them for the rest of my life. Okay, so here when Paul is saying that, you know, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. What is Paul meaning to say? What is Paul meaning to say? I want to serve Jesus for the rest of my life, okay? Or he's saying that, you know, I want to be a, I want to be under the subjection or submission of my master who is Jesus Christ for the rest of my life life and i'm willingly subjecting i'm willingly submitting to my master and i want to be uh, uh, his slave or his servant for the rest of my life so here paul is saying this is something that he chose to do it's not that something that god has called him or put upon him or asked him to do but he's saying that it is his willing choice because it's a choice that any servant or a slave has to make but paul here says that god has called him what god has called him as an look at your bibles verse 1 god has called him to be an apostle right god has called him to be an apostle so who's an apostle 
Yes, yeah, somebody who is sent out, one. And somebody who who is in authority, yes. Somebody who goes to new places where the gospel has not gone before or no work has done before. They pioneer the work. They're leaders, they're pioneers. They initiate uh, things in new, new places. Or they even initiate things in the places where they are there, but they are doing something that is new and fresh okay that's coming from god so paul is saying here that hey i have chosen to be a bond servant but there is something that god has called me to be and that is an apostle so paul is saying that he is sent to represent christ himself so he's sent by god to represent christ okay so he's saying paul a born servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, separated for the gospel of God. So he's saying here that, you know, I've been called to be sent as a representative of Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying that Christ has sent me to represent his kingdom. Okay. And then he says that he's separated for the gospel. Now in Paul's writing, you will find these three words which are very very important born servant is called by god and separated by god so these three things you will see in most of paul's letters he calls himself as a born servant some he says he's being called by god and he is being separated why do you think he often repeats this in his letters any idea why do you think he repeats this you can just think it's Simple. Why does he have to say that he's called by God? Why does he have to say that he is sent by God and he's being separated by God? Yes, Nina? Uh, there were doubts about his credentials as an apostle when he just came because, I mean, they, because what he was known for persecuting the church and then uh, that total uh, transformation and turnaround. So he felt that he, he wanted to say, I think in Corinthians, he says he was called to by the will of God. It was the will of God that he should be an apostle. So maybe he was making that clear one and bond servant that he was because repeatedly he says how he sold out completely uh, to the gospel. Even this first chapter, he says, I'm indebted. You know, I'm, he has to mm -hmm. use kind of compelled he could not help but share the gospel because it was so important to him. Yes. Thank you, Nina. So well said. Thank you. So here it's saying that, you know, when Paul's saying that, you know, he's a born servant, he's been called and separated, is because people were questioning his credentials. Hey, who are you to tell us? Who are you to tell us these doctrines bring about order in our church? Tell us what to do, what not to do, teaching us these doctrines. Who are you? So he's setting his, you know, his credentials right. Or he's telling them that, you know, I have been called by God himself. I have been set apart. I've been separated. And this is what God has called me to. And because of the authority that has been given to me by God himself, by Jesus Christ himself, that is why I am writing to you. And that is why you need to heed these things or you need to put into effect what I am writing or bring into effect what I'm telling you and writing to you. Okay. So Paul really saw himself as someone who was set aside for the gospel of God or somebody who was separated for God. Okay. Now the word separated, we need to understand it in the context of Paul. You know, uh, Paul, another thing why he says he was separated was for him, it was a very, very big thing. Okay. The first 30 years of his life, Paul was trained in, in first 30 years of his life, he was a Pharisee, yes, a very zealous Jew. Okay. And uh, he was, you know, just uh, uh, trained in Judaism. He knew the Torah, the Old Testament law. Okay. And he was a Pharisee. That's why we see, read in Philippians chapter three, where he says that, you know, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisee, which means that he was a very eminent student and an upcoming Pharisee. And something that he 
held on with such pride, with such great honor. Okay, so his whole life of and his identity for those 30 years was built on this fact that he was a Pharisee and that he was being educated as a Pharisee and that he's going to become an eminent upcoming Pharisee. Okay, for something that he held on with great pride, that was his identity. But you know, when he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, he gave up all of these things. Okay, he gave up his Jewish, uh, you know, this rituals and all of those things that he was following, ho holding on to the way he was persecuting the Christians, the way he was uh, putting down the gospel of Jesus Christ, and also his whole identity as a, a Pharisee. Okay, so he gave up all that and he came to proclaim the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The very thing that he was persecuting, the very thing he was mocking, the very thing that he was putting down was something that he became very zealous about, very passionate about, and which he lived or sold, he was sold out for the rest of his life just to preach and teach that gospel. So for him, it was a big thing. Right. For us, when we read it, we might not understand what Paul is saying when he means that he was separated. But for him, when he's writing, he's able to understand what he really means that, you know, separated. OK, what that it means for him. So for him, it was a very big thing. So in Philippians chapter three, he says, you know, everything I gained, I consider it as a loss. Right. The loss for this one reason of knowing Jesus Christ, for this one raise, reason of gaining Christ. So he says, everything I consider it as rubbish for that one reason of gaining Christ. Now, all of these are not in your notes. If you're looking at your notes, you can easily know it's not there. So if you want to take down notes, it's totally fine. Okay. So we see that he's willing to give up his, he gave up his identity of who he is, his so-called religion of Jewish uh, Judaism, okay, of, um, of being zealous Jew, of being a Pharisee. He gave up everything and to just consider everything as rubbish for that one reason to gain Christ Jesus, okay? So that is what he means when he says, you know, oh, we need to understand what Paul means when he says he was separated. For him, it was a very big thing. Okay, so he says that he was separated for, uh, uh, separated to the gospel of God. Okay, now the gospel of God, uh, we look at how Paul refers to the gospel. He refers it in many different ways in this very book of Romans. In Romans chapter 1, verse 1, and Romans chapter 15, verse 16, he says it's the gospel of God. Okay. In Romans chapter 1, verse 9, he says it's the gospel of his son. If you look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16, and Romans chapter 15, verses 19 and 29, he says this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, a gospel of Christ. So look at how he refers to the gospel. In Romans chapter 2, verse 16, and Romans chapter 16, verse 25, he refers it to my gospel. Okay, Paul is saying this is my gospel. Why is he saying it's my gospel? Why is he saying it, this is my gospel? Because he received this gospel as a direct revelation from God himself. He right? He was not a disciple of Jesus Christ. So he did not hear any of Jesus' teaching. He was very well versed, knew everything in the Old Testament. Okay. And he also was persecuting the, the believers and Christians. So he wouldn't have listened to any of what they were saying. It would have been rubbish to his ears. So he wouldn't have listened to it. But all of what he had received was direct revelation from God himself. And we know that there were silent years of uh, first seven years, I think, of Paul's life was silent tears when we don't know or read anything much. He spent that, uh, you know, few of his years in, uh, in, in Arabia where he did, you know, received direct revelations. And of course, he did uh, a few, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, he did minister in a few places. But we see that he received most of his revelation then. So he was taught directly by the Holy Spirit or by God. So direct revelation. Romans chapter 10 verse 15 says gospel of peace. So he, he talks about the gospel as a gospel of peace. So the various ways he mentions about the 
gospel. So for you, who, what is the meaning of gospel? For you and I, what, when we think about gospel, what comes to our mind? Yes, gospel is good news, OK? What else we think when we think about the gospel? What do we think? Jesus, OK? It's the good news of Jesus Christ. What else? Huh? Invitation to? Invitation to eternal life. Yes, it's basically sharing the good news with sinners so that they receive salvation. Yes, it is the power of God unto salvation. Yes, so it's um, it's sharing the good news with sinners so that they can uh, receive salvation. Or we can say that it's a way of salvation, right? But for Paul, good news was not just this. For Paul, gospel was not just the good news. For Paul, gospel was not just something that you share with sinners. For Paul, uh, the gospel was not just a way of salvation, okay? But for Paul, it was the message. It was the very message. Everything started with the gospel. Everything ended with the gospel. And it's the gospel or the message of God or it's the gospel or the message of Jesus, and it's the gospel or the message which he is so passionately preaching, which he is so passionately pursuing, which he is even being persecuted and going through hardships for, it's because of this gospel. And it is a gospel or message that brings peace in the lives of people. So when Paul looks at the gospel, for it, him, it's a very comprehensive word. It's a very full word. It's a very pregnant word. That means full with meaning. Okay. For him, it's a gospel or the message of God or the message of Jesus Christ, or it's the gospel or the message of what he is preaching, or it is the gospel or the message that brings peace in the lives of people. So that is what for him is the gospel. Okay. Also, if you look at your notes, there are other titles of the gospel that is mentioned. Uh, gospel of the kingdom. We read this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. If you look at Mark chapter 1, verse 1, it refers there as a gospel of Jesus Christ. If you read Acts chapter 20, verse 24, it's talking about the gospel of the grace of God. And if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it's talking about the gospel of the glory of Christ. And Galatians chapter 2, verse 7 is talking about the gospel for the uncircumcised or the gospel for the circumcised, okay? Which means Jews and non-Jews as well. So he's saying that this is the gospel for which he was separated. This is the gospel which he is preaching. And this is the gospel of the Son and this is the gospel that he is preaching, which is the gospel of peace, which was promised through the prophets. Okay. So let's, let's look at verse 2. Can somebody read verse 2, please? Verse 2. Yeah. Verse 2. Which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Yes. So here it's saying that the gospel was there. When? When was the gospel there? In the Old Testament, yes. The gospel was there in the Old Testament. And who was it proclaimed by in the Old Testament? The prophets in the Old Testament. So the, the message that Paul is preaching is a message of the gospel or the message of the good news which was promised through the prophets in the Old Testament. Like I said in the introduction, Paul keeps on going back to the Old Testament. Why does he do that? He's talking to the Jews. He's also well versed in the Old Testament. And so he is talking from that perspective as well. So he's saying that the, you know, the this message of the good news was promised through the prophets, and it was also proclaimed through the prophets in the Old Testament. And notice how and what he mentions about the Old Testament. What does he talk about, say about the Old Testament? How does he refer to the Old Testament? Verse 2. How does he refer to the Holy? It was promised, okay. How does he, what does he mention about the Old Testament? 
holy scriptures. Yes, he says that he refers to the Old Testament as holy scriptures. Okay, so we see Paul's regard for the Old Testament. He's saying that the Old Testament is holy scriptures. And in the Old Testament, he's saying that the prophets were promising about this good news that was coming. And what is the good news? Or who was coming? The coming of Jesus Christ. Okay, so we see in verse 2, Paul un Paul's understanding that the gospel that he is preaching or the gospel that we are preaching today is not something new. It is something that was spoken of in the Old Testament through the prophets. And we also see here in verse 2, Paul's heart for the Old Testament. He says that the Old Testament is holy scriptures. Okay. I don't know if you look at, some of them never read the Old Testament, right? They only read the New Testament. They think Old Testament is old. <laughs> You know, it's gone. The old is gone. The new has come. They misquote and misread it. But we are able to understand the New Testament in the light of the Old Testament. Right? Without the Old Testament, we cannot understand the New Testament. Okay? Everything in the New Testament we see is the fulfillment of what was spoken in the Old Testament. Not only the prophecies, but also the feasts, the rituals, the um, sacrifices, everything that God had instituted, even the laws, the commandments, everything that God had instituted in the Old Testament, we see everything fulfilled in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That is why we don't do any more of those sacrifices, those feasts, anything we don't do. Why? Because everything is fulfilled in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So if you look and study the Old Testament, we understand the Old Testament in the light of the New Testament. We understand the New Testament in the light of the Old Testament. Okay. So we'll move on. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Can somebody else please read verses 3 and 4, please? Concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrections from the dead. Amen. So here we're saying we're seeing that the gospel is about whom? Jesus Christ, yes. And uh, in relation to Jesus Christ, Paul is mentioning two things here, okay? So in relationship to Jesus Christ, Paul is mentioning two things here. He's saying in the natural, Jesus came in the flesh, okay? And he came in the flesh as a descendant of David, okay? Why is this important? Why is he mentioning this here? This is mentioned in the Old Testament. Very good. This is mentioned in the Old Testament. So he's saying that this is important to know because this is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. All the Old Testament prophecies were saying that the one Messiah who is going to come, would, and they were talking about the root of David or the offspring of David or the seed of David. And they were pointing to someone who would come in the line of David. And that's why Jesus, that's why God says, your line will never come to end. There will always be kings on your uh, throne, okay? Your generations, there will be forever the king on the throne. So who is the forever king? Jesus Christ. And that is another fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. So they were all pointing to someone coming in the line of David, and Jesus is the one who came in the line of David. He was a seed of David. The second thing we see, so that is a natural aspect that we are seeing, okay, according to the flesh, what is mentioned is a natural aspect. The second one is we see that who was he truly, who was the son of God truly? Who was the son of God truly? Jesus, yes, but who was he truly? God, yes, because why do we say he's God? Because he came in the power of the spirit of holiness and he was raised from the 
dead. Okay, he was truly the son of God. How do we know that he was truly the son of God? Is because he came in the power of the spirit of holiness and he was raised from the dead. So if someone asks you, how can you say that Jesus was truly the son of God? How do we know that? You can point them out to Romans chapter 1 verse 4. That he came in the power of the spirit of holiness and he was raised from the dead. How is the Holy Spirit referred to here? Spirit of holiness. Okay, we need to think about that. Okay, we need to pause and think the Holy Spirit as the spirit of holiness you know sometimes when we use uh, the, the the name of the holy spirit we use it as just like somebody else's name right even when we use the name of god the father son holy spirit you know we just lose it at some other name mostly the holy spirit we use it like we use someone else's name just like we use another name or commonly use someone's name but here we see that he's a spirit of holiness so when we use the name of the Holy Spirit in a very common way, you know, the whole meaning of who the Holy Spirit is lost, okay? For some of us, the Holy Spirit can just mean what? Who does the Holy Spirit mean to you? Helper? God? Teacher? Okay. Comforter? Okay. The Holy Spirit can just sometimes mean that, okay, leader, okay, can also mean that he's just the Spirit of God, right? Or he's one of the persons of the Trinity <clears throat> or one of the persons of the Godhead, a title that comes very easily to our minds. But when we turn it around and say he's a Spirit of holiness, it causes us to actually pause and think, okay? So when I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, I'm actually speaking about the spirit of holiness. Not only is he holy, but his presence is also holy. But sometimes when we speak about the Holy Spirit, when we invite the Holy Spirit, when we do church, you know, and, uh, you know, we invite the Holy Spirit, we have no sense of reverence. We have no sense of awe of who this third person of the trinity is or third person of the godhead is we speak so much of the holy spirit we welcome him in our midst but sometimes we have lost that whole meaning of who he really is and for us it can he can just be someone who is a like you know so for some people is a holy ghost for some people he just baptizes you with power some people is just helper counselor teacher comforter but he's actually god right do we give him that reverence do we give him that awe when we call and welcome the holy spirit are we thinking that it's the the spirit of holiness that is coming in our midst the spirit of holiness that is moving in our midst it's a spirit of holiness that is working in our midst okay so i want you to ponder and think about this so next time when we invite the holy spirit or you invite the holy spirit or you are calling on the Holy Spirit, remember that he's a spirit of holiness. And you need to submit in reverence and in awe and give him that honor, the due that is, you know, he deserves as, as God and as one who is holy and mighty. Okay. So that's just a side thought about the Holy Spirit. But it says here, but the man, in the but, but here, you know, the, it, uh, the main thought here is that Jesus Christ was proclaimed, was announced, and revealed as the Son of God with, with what? Look at uh, verses 3 and 4. Jesus Christ was proclaimed, announced, and revealed as the Son of God with what? With power. Yes, according to the Holy, the Spirit of Holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Okay? So two things here, the Son of God with power and the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. And both of these point out to Jesus as the Son of God. Why is he the Son of God? Because he's a Son of God with power and he's a Son of God who was resurrected from the dead. Okay. 
Any questions, any doubts before we move on to verse 5? Okay. If there's no questions, can somebody read verse 5, please? Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Amen. So Paul is saying that through Christ, what have we received? Grace and apostleship. Okay. Now there is grace and there is apostleship. Now, apostleship has to do with what? Okay. Apostleship has to do with what? It's a function. It's a calling. Right? It's a commission. Is it something that you just desire to be an apostle? Apostle Nina, Apostle Selina, Apostle Sri Radha, Apostle Francis, Apostle Nikhil? No? Right? It's not something that you choose. Right? Uh, apostle Chira is not something that you choose. It's who becomes an apostle? Yes, some, it's an office, that fivefold ministry office that we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Right? It's a fivefold ministry office, and it's something that we don't choose, something that we don't desire. It's not something that we think we have the charisma, the talents, the abilities. It's something that God calls us into. It's an office that God calls us into. So when he calls us into that office, he commissions us. He gives us a work to do. And we have a mission that God has given us to do. And to fulfill that role of an apostle, what is given to us? What is given to us to fulfill our gifts and our callings and our function? What is given, given to us? Grace. Grace has been given to each one of us to fulfill the calling, the gifting, and the function. What is grace? Yes, grace is favor. But in the, in the New Testament, wherever we read grace, what is the meaning of grace? We learned it in fulfilling God's purpose for your life. Unmerited. Unmerited favor, everyone says grace, but what is grace? Divine favor, divine empowerment, and divine character. Three things. Divine favor, that's favor of God, to do specific calling and gifting and function. It's also divine empowerment, which God empowers you. Holy Spirit empowers you, divine enablement. He enables you to fulfill that call and that function and the gifting and divine character. Why divine character? The character, they cannot, you, God cannot pour out his anointing. The anointing will be wasted. Okay, so character to be like Christ Jesus. Okay, so here we see that grace is God's empowering in our life to do the commission, the work, the mission that God has given to us okay and this is a common way that paul talks about ministry okay he says through christ we have received grace and apostleship so what is the commission we are given all of us are given what commission we have been given this commission to bring people to the obedience to the faith in christ jesus in all the world look at Verse 5, it says, we have received grace and apostleship, the commission, the mission, the work, to do what? To bring people to the obedience, to the faith in Christ Jesus in all the world. Okay, we'll stop here. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll... Um, and no doubts will end class. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining class today. I'll see you tomorrow, and we'll continue with Romans chapter 1, verse 5.